eating and sleep disturbances or disorders. In this section, we will talk about anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, eating disorder not otherwise specified or NOS, narcolepsy, sleep apnea, as well as insomnia. Let's begin with a question, and I'll pause for a second as you read it, then we will discuss it. So what do we have here? We have a 15-year-old who was found vomiting and reports that she vomits daily after each meal. She collapses and she's 5'5", weighs 90 pounds. What is her most likely diagnosis? Our answer here is B, anorexia nervosa. Why is that? Our distinguishing features here that we're going to talk about in a moment with anorexia will be the patient's low BMI as well as the overall picture that you're seeing of a patient who is excessively exercising, a patient is vomiting after meals, and so on. This gives you the overall picture of an anorexic patient, whereas a bulimic patient could have some similar effects. However, will have a normal BMI, will not have disturbances in their met metabolism. Let's begin talking now about anorexia nervosa. By definition, we're looking at a failure to maintain a normal body weight. So you must always look for that in the presentation. And why is there that failure? Because there's a fear or preoccupation with gaining weight. There's a body image disturbance here at the core. There's an unrealistic self-evaluation as overweight. What does this mean? The patient looks in the mirror, even though she's 90 pounds, and sees 900 pounds. So as far as she knows, she's huge, morbidly obese, even though she's way underweight. They tend to deny their emaciated condition. If you tell this patient, hey, you look emaciated, you look like you're sick or that you've lost too much weight, they say, no, what do you mean? I'm overweight, I'm so fat, I hate the way I look. They show great concern with appearance and frequently examine and weigh themselves. This is the patient who's constantly looking in the mirror, looks for every possible scale, and is obsessed with the way they look and how much they weigh. They typically lose weight by maintaining strict caloric control, or by trying all kinds of other ways. Exercising excessively, many of us don't have that kind of problem. They purge, or they can fast, or they can abuse laxatives and diuretics. The overall picture here that we're looking at is a low body weight and the patient maintaining that by all kinds of creative ways. Your patient here is more frequently a teenage girl, somewhere between the age of 14 to 18. And there is evidence in her of severe weight loss. There can also be hypotension, bradycardia, lanugo hair, edema could be present. The EKG changes, like rhythmic disorders, can also result because of potassium deficiency. And arrhythmia is the most common cause of death in these patients. And this is also one of the reasons why you admit these patients. Because of the electrolyte imbalances and the metabolic disturbances that these patients have, it can become life-threatening in them and is no longer just a matter of body image but can now be fatal. So how do we manage this patient? Well, in severe cases we will hospitalize them to prevent dehydration, starvation, electrolyte imbalance, and death. We don't want the patient to have those cardiac abnormalities, the rhythm issues, arrhythmias, and potentially die. We will hospitalize them to normalize all those values. Then what? Then you can, you can use psychotherapy to re-correct or reorient the patient's body image and show them that they are indeed not overweight but underweight, along with behavioral therapy. And SSRIs have been used because they will promote weight gain as well as also help with the overall mood of the patient. Now contrast this with bulimia nervosa. In bulimia nervosa, you can have frequent binge eating as well as a lack of control of overeating episodes. These patients have compensatory behavior to prevent weight gain in the form of purging, misuse of laxatives, diuretics, fasting, or excessive exercise. Again, note here the difference between anorexia and bulimia is that there is no problem in the body mass index of the bulimic patients in terms of it's not low as it is in the anorexic patient. How do you want to diagnose and manage this? This is also more frequent in women and 
It occurs later in adolescence than anorexia nervosa. And most are normal weight. That's very, very important. You could also even have a history of obesity. So because of that, because there's a normal weight, there isn't a need to hospitalize these patients unless you have the case of severe electrolyte abnormality present. But for the most part, the big distinguishing feature, because you'll, you'll have the exercise, the laxative use, all those kinds of things can be present in both, as well as the purging, what's the, the big differentiating factor is normal weight in bulimia. Therapy will also be similar, because here you can use psychotherapy as well as SSRIs in bulimic patients. Now let's talk about binge eating disorder. By definition, this is the essential feature here is recurrent episodes of binge eating that occur at least three times per week for more than three months. So now remember those criteria. Three times a week, three months. Binge eating episodes. The patients here are overweight and they usually lose or lack their sense of self-control over their binge eating habits. These episodes are associated with eating faster than usual, eating until feeling uncontrollably full, eating large amounts of food in the absence of hunger, eating alone, feeling disgusted with oneself after the eating episode. A big hallmark here is that these patients still want to enjoy food, are still enjoying it excessively, and they've lost their control over eating in moderation. And always remember now, three episodes per week for more than three months. Now, what can we do to treat these patients? What can we do to help them? Well, topiramate has been proven efficacious. It's really helped patients with binge eating disorder. So that's the go-to. SSRIs here may have a limited benefit. So for the exam question, your next best step in management or your best initial therapy will be topiramate. Psychotherapy is also indicated. CBT, or cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal psychotherapy, as well as DBT, dialectic behavioral therapy, can be indicated here as well. Eating disorder not otherwise specified. These patients basically don't meet criteria for either anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. This is a wastebasket diagnosis. After you've run out of criteria for both of these, anorexia and bulimia, now you got to put them somewhere. You say, well... This is eating disorder, NOS, not otherwise specified. Basically here, because the criteria for anorexia, uh, if it's present in girls, but menstruation is normal, because in anorexic patients, their menstruation will be abnormal. However, in this case, in eating disorder, not otherwise, special, not otherwise specified, the criteria for anorexia nervosa is present, except for normal menstruation. Or, you have an anorexic patient with normal body weight. Or you have a use of compensatory behavior after eating normal amounts of food. So it's not binge eating because they're not eating large amounts of food. They're just eating regular amounts of food, but they're doing some compensatory activity. So it could have some element of different disorders, but not meet the full criteria for any one of the other eating disorders. Now we shift from eating to sleeping. We begin with narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is defined as excessive daytime sleepiness. You also have abnormalities in your REM sleep, and it frequently begins in young adulthood. The sleep studies here are indicated for the diagnosis. There isn't a particular therapy that can be curative, but you could manage with four snaps during the day, or another high-yield exam question will be, pharmacologically, what can you do? You can give modafinil. That's the medication used to maintain alertness. You can also use methylphenidate and dextramphetamine. However, modafinil will be your better answer for the exam. Overall here, narcolepsy, in terms of diagnosis, how you would diagnose it, you would order a sleep study. In terms of how it's defined, you're looking for that excessive sleepiness and treatment of modafinil. Let's discuss some psychiatric and physical symptoms of sleep disorders. And differentiate between these, these are often tested. Sleep attacks, what does that mean? A sleep attack is an episode of irresistible sleepiness and feeling refreshed upon awakening. This is a person who will be standing there and all of a sudden will have an irresistible urge to sleep. And once they wake up, they're fully awake and alert and refreshed. Versus cataplexy, 
This is a patient who will lose muscle tone. Now bear in mind, the sleep attack patient is not going to just collapse. The cataplexy patient will actually collapse. They will lose muscle tone, and it's considered pathognomonic and couldn't be precipitated by loud noises or emotions. Now we go to hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations. These are hallucinations that occur as the patient is going to sleep and waking up, respectively. It's important to recognize these because when you're eliciting a history and you're getting a history of hallucinations, you want to know if they're related to sleep or if they're happening independently during the day. Now contrast this with sleep paralysis. This is the patient who is awake but can't move. This, this is the patient that will typically occur when they're about to wake up or they're upon waking and they feel like they're awake but they're paralyzed. It's very scary for patients and we know it as sleep paralysis. Sleep apnea. This is defined as the cessation or the stopping of airflow at the nose or mouth during sleep because of obstruction of the airway. This is obstructive sleep apnea. You could also have a central cause. This results in episodes of decreased arterial oxygen saturation and episodic arousal. These patients are overweight and they have a very loud snore and they complain of daytime fatigue. Let's talk about diagnosis of sleep apnea. Polysomnogram will show episodes of apnea lasting more than 10 seconds. You're going to have a decrease of your arterial oxygenation, bradycardia, as well as increased diaphragmatic effort. The medical complications here can be arrhythmias, pulmonary hypertension, and occasionally death. These patients that we said in your diagnosis will be the obese patient who's sleepy during the day, and oftentimes the spouse or partner will be the one telling you about their snoring, which is a very key exam finding. And these are all findings and manifestations of obstructive sleep apnea, not central. Let's talk about the treatment for sleep apnea. There are some available treatments. The problem sometimes is compliance. Patients don't always want to use these things, even though they can be pretty effective. Nasal continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP, is one thing that can be offered but oftentimes the patients have a hard time sleeping with it. Weight loss would be pretty ideal, but as you discover in every other section, weight loss will help a lot of things. Not a lot of patients want to do it. Corrective surgery could also help if there are particular indications of obstruction in the airway that can be resolved. Also, avoidance of sedatives and alcohol is an overall lifestyle modification that will contribute to and help sleep apnea course and treatments.